people want to come in, they want to spend minimum budgets on only retargeting or only repurchasing, which is a piece of the puzzle, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. It's not where DSP really shines. Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce evolution podcast. I'm your host, Brett Curry, CEO of OMG Commerce, and today is a very special episode. We have not one, but two guests, and not just two any old guests. These are OMG experts. One guest you undoubtedly know, he's been on the show many, many times, my business partner and the co-founder of OMG Commerce, Mr. Chris Brewer. Chris, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good to be back. That is... uh it's it's going well. It's a little warm down here in the heat box, but other than that, it's all good. Yeah, so OMG HQ is in uh, beautiful Springfield, Missouri. We're experiencing some unseasonably mild temperatures. It's still summertime, but it's feeling pretty good. Uh, but Chris is down in Florida and is hot. It's always hot, and so you kind of know that. Like, you know that moving in, so just the way it goes. Uh, but Chris is not the only guest. As I mentioned, there are two guests, and the other guests on the show... This is not just his first time on this show. This is his first time on any podcast. But this guy is an Amazon DSP legend, and that is our topic today. We're talking about Amazon DSP, what that means, what you should know about it, how you can utilize it, and all sorts of good stuff around Amazon DSP. And so Austin Chambers, DSP specialist for OMG Commerce, is our other guest. Austin, what's up, man? How's it going? And thanks for joining the show. Yeah, good to be here. It's going pretty good. It's definitely a, a little change of pace for me from being behind the scenes usually. So yeah, you're you're behind the scenes. You you know how to work a spreadsheet. This guy understands line items and orders and all kinds of stuff related to DSP. He can nerd out with the best of them, but understands the tactical side, the strategic side. But yeah, podcasting. This is new for you, yep. and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're gonna dive right in. For those that do not know. What is what is Amazon DSP? So, Mr. Expert, why don't you start? So for for a newbie, a, a DSP is a demand side platform. So it's a, a platform to do display advertising. Um, Amazon DSP is obviously Amazon's demand side platform. There are DSPs all over the place. Google Google Ads is a, a version of something like that, but Amazon's is exclusive to Amazon. Um, only accessible through Amazon. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So w- one, there's a little bit of confusion as to what DSP is because there's another Amazon DSP. So we're talking demand side platform. We're all about advertising and accelerating growth and getting new customers, making sales on Amazon. But do you know what the other DSP stands for, Chris? This may be the DSP some people have in mind. Well, there is one with Amazon. When you when you Google it, it's their delivery uh which is like brilliant naming convention when they started this. I think this does sort of underscore the fact that that Amazon kind of operates in these small autonomous teams. And, and sometimes these teams do not talk to each other at all, right? So yeah, the other DSP is delivery service provider, right? So and actually there was a point in time where I was like, I want to start a DSP, that kind of DSP. Like if I find that I knew this guy was into logistics, I'm like, hey, what if we partner together? We start this business. And he's like, dude, That'd be a terrible business. And then after I looked at the numbers, after, after I looked at the numbers, I'm like, you're you're correct. Um, so we're not talking about the delivery service provider, but demand side platform. And to people that don't know, and I, I'm glad you laid it out that way, Austin, people may think that DSP is unique to Amazon, like if that's their only exposure, but it's actually a generic advertising term, demand side platform. It just means it's a platform that advertisers can access and utilize and run ads on. However, the name's a little bit misleading because getting access to Amazon DSP either requires a special seat or massive amounts of ad spend or a connection with an agency like ours. But simply put, Amazon DSP is a way to run display ads, video ads on and off Amazon, but utilizing Amazon's shopper data. Now, Austin, from your perspective, why is that a big deal that we can use Amazon's shopper data to build our our ad targeting. Yeah, well, the main thing is Amazon has hundreds of millions of shoppers, even just in the US, um, and they don't share that first party data with anyone. It's all all housed internally. 
So using Amazon's DSP as a way for us to build custom audiences or Amazon built audiences to target shoppers based on data signals straight from Amazon. We're not relying on a third party doing market research. We're getting the the metrics straight from Amazon. Yeah, love it. And and Chris, from your perspective, why why is that why is that such a big deal to harness Amazon's shopper behavioral data? For one, if you're a seller, you you, you can't if somebody visits your page and decides to keep shopping, looking at other comparisons, seeing who's got a promo or a deal, um, having access to that data is huge because you can quickly, within milliseconds, I think, Austin, retarget those people. Um, and, and you know, we can talk about it too, but you, know, you, can, you can also, you don't necessarily have to be an Amazon seller to harness the power of that data, Brett. You can also run ads off platform to the that audience which can also be valuable uh depending on your your brand and what you're looking from a return perspective yeah and you know no one has more shopper data than amazon nobody has more shoppers in the u.s and nobody has that data like amazon and you're not getting that data any other way other than utilizing it through the amazon dsp platform and you know it just it just works and so when when you take that data from Amazon and then combine that with the ad networks that you have access to through DSP. Now you can reach any Amazon shopper at any time and it can be extremely effective. So talk about that just a little bit, Austin, like where, where might our ads show up? So I'm running DSP. I can, I can target people based on what they're in the market for, what they're shopping for, what they viewed on Amazon. I can, I can target them based on that. Where might my ads show up? Really all over the place. I'd say Typically, 80% plus of spend is on-site ads. So whether that's product detail pages on Amazon, so whether that's product detail pages on the sidebar and search results, um, stuff like that. But also Amazon has partnerships with a few dozen different third-party, what they're called open exchanges, where whether it's the Google or, um, I mean, you can show on Weather Channel, Yahoo. So you have access to and less inventory virtually. It's almost the entire internet. or It's like the whole internet that you would want to be associated with, you can access through Amazon DSP. And yeah, there's actually a backdoor into the Google Display Network, and we're a big Google agency as well. Chris and I have been doing Google Ads since uh, forever. And so the, what's cool is now you, you can run ads on the Google Display Network through Amazon DSP based on what people are shopping for on Amazon. But to your point, Austin, 80% of the time, your ads are showing up on Amazon.com search results page, there are some areas on the side and at the bottom where display ads show up. Even on product detail pages, even on your competitors' product detail pages, you can run Amazon DSP ads, which is brilliant on Amazon's part. They don't care. They don't care if like someone buys from you or from your competitor. They just want someone to buy. But it's also pretty awesome from your perspective too. If you can show up on a competitor's page and steal that shopper, why not do it? Which is pretty great. So uh, let's do this, guys. Let's let's talk about some results because you know we, we laid a, a decent foundation there. We'll keep uh, layering on to that, but to get people excited, you know what what could we see here? Um, you know, with Amazon DSP, what what are what are the potentials? So give us give us a case study, Austin. Get us excited about the opportunity here. Yeah, and my my favorite case study is actually on our website. So if you if you go to the the DSP page on our website, it's linked there, but. Um, this is a brand that came to us almost two years ago and they had been spending 12, 13,000, I think was the average for 2021, um, on a monthly basis per month on DSP, just on DSP. They were in like the 175, $200,000 range on PPC. So pretty low percentage of overall spend was on DSP. Client came to me and he basically said, here's the keys to the house. I want to push on DSP. Let's get everybody excited about Amazon DSP. Let's talk about a case study. What What is one of your favorite Amazon DSP case studies and what's possible with DSP? So my my favorite case is a, an example. It's a, a client that came to me about two years ago. They were doing good on PPC, doing good on the, on the seller side of things. We have been pretty consistent on DSP, averaging 12, 13,000 in ad spend over the course of the 2021 year. Um, but it came, came to me, said, hey, uh, I want to lead into DSP more. Here are the keys to the house. So 
I love hearing that. By the way, yes, we will always, if it's a brand we know, like, and trust, we will always accept the keys of the house. We'll take very good care of your house. But yes, we are, we, we very much love to hear that phrase. I took that and kind of ran with it. We like to, we like to ease in. We don't want to blow up the boat overnight. Um, so we'll increase, you know, 13,000 to, to 17 to 20 to 25, um, throughout the course of the 2022 year, I think we averaged right around 30, 35,000 in ad spend per month. So up for 13,000, um, PPC ad spend remained flat year over year. So it was a difference of less than 1% difference in PPC so ad spend. Tripling, basically tripling DSP spend. Sponsored spend, so Amazon PPC basically stayed the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mainly flat. Yeah, basically flat on the PPC side. Um, take that into 2023, we've increased to about 50,000 a month in DSP ad spend. We've actually seen a decrease on the PPC side by 10% or so. Um, sales are up 35% versus 2021 when looking at it on a monthly average. So tacos, the and we we use DSP ad spend um, when figuring that tacos is down from 35 to 40 down to under 30 some months. So we've increased DSP ad spend by 3x plus, but also decreased tacos at the same time and and increased PPC efficiency. Beautiful. Love this so much. So we've we've gone you know, accelerated to the floor, but in a very controlled, methodical, measured approach, but triple DSP ad spend, but we've been able to reduce sponsored ad spend and now total efficiency, total talk house is better than it's ever been. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. A couple of key learnings here. You know, uh, I get the fortunate place to be able to talk to a lot of potential DSP advertisers and now, you know, this case study is a little different because they kind of passed the trust threshold with OMG. They were currently advertising and obviously knew what we we could do. But the key factor here with this particular client, and I can't emphasize this anymore to brands, is they gave us the road, the, the leeway to be able to grow and not just like, hey, let's test this for two or three months and see how, how it goes. Because typically when I've seen new brands come in, we, we used to all actually allow a three-month DSP test, and that's usually what it ended up. People limped along, spent the bare minimum, and then were kind of couldn't really tell actually how it was impacting because you looked at this DSP spend relative to their PPC spend, and it was like like one percentage, two percentage, three percent. You're not going to be able to tell any sales differences from those kind of numbers. So... They stuck with it, and they had a team that could focus strategically. And this is a key difference because the when we get dis, DSP advertisers coming from other places, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of times it's places that are using somebody else's seat or it's software-driven, and they don't have people that really understand how to effectively use the audiences and scale. So that's something just to keep in mind. Yeah, it's really interesting. We, we do talk to people and, and DSP is a bit of a controversial uh, channel and we'll get into this more later, but there's there's been a couple of Twitter storms or, or X storms, I guess you should say, uh, now where people are like dogging DSP. And we have talked to a number of brands that have not had a great experience with DSP, but we found exactly what you said, Chris. We're like, okay, well, how much did you test? How did you test? What did you do? And they're like, well, we spent, you know, 3000 a month. And we, when we do the math and look at the traffic that generated, we can say that increased the number of shoppers to your pages by like 2 or 3%. It makes sense then that you wouldn't feel that or wouldn't notice that, right? If you're already growing, a little 2 or 3% bump, you know, maybe you see it, maybe you don't. And so, so yeah, this is unique where this client trusted us uh, and we'd, we'd earned that trust, we'd proven it, and we're able to scale. I do think, and this is just a, a quick side note, um, because I know we got we have agencies listening. You'll amen this. We have a lot of clients listening to this. You're working with an agency. Um, obviously, don't trust someone until they've earned it. But when you want someone to steer the strategy or steer campaigns, don't also keep your hand on the wheel, right? Like if you if you're steering and you got someone over on the passenger seat trying to you know jerk the wheel, uh, bad things happen. 
And so, uh, yeah, this is one where we were given a little bit of free reign and we took advantage of it and proved it out. And so what's also interesting about this is I think a lot of brands hit a bit of a ceiling with sponsored ads. I love sponsored product ads, sponsored brand, sponsored brand video. I think they're foundational. I think you got to start there and really get those working well first. But sometimes you hit a ceiling where you can't really scale more than you are now efficiently. And that's where DSP can come in. So it can create great top of funnel growth, great remarketing growth, great repurchase growth, um, and, and help you even improve your tacos, which is amazing. And I'll provide a little bit of context to what Chris said about people coming in spending two, three percent of their ad dollars on DSP. This client was spending in the in the single digits, five, six, seven percent. Their monthly sales can fluctuate that much each month anyways. So yeah. cutting out that much spend or adding that much spend, it's it's hard to see the difference. It'll look normal. The patterns yeah. are gonna look the same. Patterns are gonna look the same. So we took that from seven percent to I mean a quarter of their ad spend almost plus. So Whenever you add that much, when it's that substantial of a percentage of the overall piece, um, you can tell when it makes a difference. Yeah, love it. So, so what are what are some of the the top mistakes you see Amazon DSP advertisers, you know, sellers making with Amazon DSP? We talked about one where you're you're testing at such a small level, you'll never be able to feel the difference. Now, I will say, I think you should test in a way that's reasonable, right? Don't just start spending 50 grand a month if that, unless that's an insignificant amount to you, which I know some sellers it is. Um, so you want to you test smartly, but test in a way that we're going to see the difference. So that's a mistake. What are some other mistakes you see people make? You already said it. Testing small, testing only bottom of funnel is one of the, the biggest things. People want to come in. They want to spend minimum budgets on only retargeting or only repurchasing, which is a piece of the puzzle, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Um, it's not where DSP really shines. I like to spend roughly a third on bottom of the funnel tactics. Um, when you're only spending a small percentage of overall ad spend on bottom of the funnel, you're not going to see a big difference. Um, the other thing which Chris alluded to is people only wanting to test for a short period of time. In this case study, it was six plus months of scaling before we actually started to see a difference in the monthly averages. So can't speak to exactly why that's the case, but that's what we've seen time and again. So giving it, you know, six, seven, eight months of scaling and being a significant piece of the pie for it to actually prove itself out. Um, and then one of the, the other things, and one of the biggest things for me is judging it strictly off ROAS. Um, DSP, when you're talking mid and upper funnel DSP, um, with awareness campaigns, if you judge them by ROAS, it's going to be a fail 99% of the time. Um, especially when you consider Amazon's attribution model is last touch or last click. Whenever you're running awareness campaigns, that's going to be their first touch. They might have three or four other ad types they come on conduit with along the way. So of course that in-market campaign is not going to have a good ROAS. Um, so Typically, if you're just judging all of the campaigns based on ROAS or ACOS, you're gonna you're gonna be disappointed. Yeah, I, lo I love this so much, and I think the way you should look at this is is more the way you might look at at YouTube or Facebook, where part of this is generating awareness and building a brand and getting people to convert later. Uh, you know, anything that's not bottom of funnel. Part of the impact or benefit is the lift you generate or the halo effect generated. You know, the one reason why people love sponsored products and they get addicted to it and actually they get a little bit spoiled with sponsored product ads is to immediate gratification, right? If someone clicks on a sponsored product ad because they are likely very close to making a purchase, they're interested, they're comparison shopping, they're ready to pull the trigger. And so that's where you get, you know, 10, 15, 20% conversion rates, you know, something like that on some product detail pages. So um, DSP is not the same. If you're running remarketing or retargeting, that can be similar. But, you know, the real beauty, the real magic of DSP is when you can layer on some of the other targeting. And over time, you're building that top of funnel interest and it is going to create a lift. And, you know, this is one of those things where you have to have a little bit of faith, right? We're still measuring. We can still see, like, are we on the right track even in the early days? But the real benefit comes six, seven months later, like you talked about, Austin, where hey, you know what? We're spending more on DSP, but our tacos, our, our total advertising cost of sales, the total percentage we're spending on ads has gone down 
because of DSP, which is awesome. So um, let's talk about let's talk about some of the what are some of the strategies you recommend? Um, how are we utilizing DSP? You said about a third for bottom of funnels, like third remarketing repurchase. Where did the other two thirds go? Yeah, so I like to do thirds for bottom, mid, and upper funnel. Typically, that's not a one size fits all, but that's usually um, pretty close. So when we're talking mid funnel, it's going after people that are already familiar with um, your competitors. They're in the market for you're selling product A, your competitor's selling product A. Um, so they're looking at your competitors. So we're targeting either people that have viewed those competitor products or we're targeting the product pages themselves. Um, so this is combination of con contextual targeting and competitive remarketing is what a lot of people call it. Well, may maybe too, Austin, and forgive me, Brett, if this is on your roster of questions later, but I think it may be a good time because, uh, I, and I'm just remembering things I talk to people on calls and things come up around the same same time frames we're talking about audiences, is how is what OMG can do with our own DSP seat different from sponsor brand display, some of the display options that you already have within sponsored, like where is it good? Where is it limited? People often want to understand the difference there. So one of the main differences between DSP and sponsor display is the way you can customize your targeting. So sponsor display is really good at some things. One of the things I love about it the most, which is not available through DSP, is bidding on a CPC basis. Um, so DSP is strictly CPM, so we're paying for per impressions, not strictly for clicks. Um, but with sponsor display, you're a little bit more limited with the type of targeting as far as overlapping and excluding certain audiences. Um, with DSP, we can target a viewer of a specific product. Um, we can exclude people that have already purchased that product or a competitor product or people that have viewed 30 days ago, but not within the past 15 days. Um, with sponsor display, you're kind of at the mercy of what they offer. So last 90 day viewers kind of open-ended, um, last 365 day purchasers. I can target people that have purchased in the last 30 days if I wanted to. Um, so the customizability with DSP is far and away better with sponsor display. And from what we've seen, the scalability is as well with sponsor display on both our clients and other, other clients or other brands that I've talked to. Sometimes they had a, a pretty low cap on sponsor display spend, which is something that we rarely struggle with on DSP. Yeah. DSP way more customizable, targetable. Uh, and you can really scale it, which is, which is amazing. Now, Chris, you've mentioned a, a couple of things. You mentioned something a few times that I bet people have heard and they're like, wait, what, what is he, what is he talking about? Like a seat? Like we're talking about a chair? What is, what is the seat? So can you explain that? What is, what is, what does it mean to have a DSP seat? And why is that a little bit unique right now? It's been, I think over five years, Brett, you're, um, yeah, but yeah, for sure. It was like 2017. We had heard about uh, DSP, a guy that actually used to work with us heard about it, and we started to ask questions of our Amazon team about it. And back then, I don't know what it is now, but back then it was like you had to have thirty thousand dollars as a brand individually to advertise on DSP. But then I think it was like thirty to fifty a month you had to commit to to get to get a seat for DSP. Yeah, yeah. And so back then we didn't have that because we didn't have any advertisers at that point for DSP. But we started to get some in, and I don't know. We got we got our own our own play our own platform. And so here's the key key things that you need to ask for, especially if you're out looking for a Amazon DSP provider, is one find out how experienced the team that's going to be actually overseeing the campaigns and the ads is. Um, ask them how much time they kind of spend in the account. Do I get a strategic dis discussion? Because what, what you'll ferret out there sometimes is if they are outsourcing that, because some places say, oh, sure, we have our own seat. But what they mean is their seat is their advertising software provider, and they're running it through that. And again, all I can tell you is the feedback I've I've had from, from some of those. We get a decent amount of, of leads from those kinds of relationships. We've also 
uh, you know, ourselves uh, provided seats to software companies, uh, but we do it a little differently to kind of give them that that strategy. And so that I don't, that's basically it. You know, we've we've even helped agencies kind of have a seat through us so that they can get enough to kind of get their own. So we're we try to be a good uh, industry partner there as well. Kind of help the ecosystem where we're friendly to other agencies, right? We're not, uh, we don't keep all of our toys just to ourselves. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a great question to ask. Do you have your own seat? And then what kind of experience do you have with DSP? You know, we've been doing this for five plus years. I think it was 2018-ish. Uh, we were the, one of the fastest growing Amazon DSP agencies. So, so myself, our Amazon director, we had to fly out to uh, Amazon to the HQ. We had dinner with Jeff Bezos. Uh, just so so all of that was true except the Jeff Bezos part did not see him did not meet him but we did get to go to Amazon HQ which is cool and so yeah ask those questions and so they Amazon has kept the barrier pretty high to get an Amazon DSP seat for a while they were not making it available to anybody I think that's opened up a little bit but anyway uh so OMG is a little bit unique in that sense so we've had a seat for a long time very seasoned very experienced we had a direct line to the Amazon DSP team so that that's pretty special good question to ask is um, well, if we if we run DSP with you, can we get access to the platform so we can kind of get in there and see what you're doing? And if they say, oh, sure, we'll give you a dashboard access, usually that means they've got some kind of software overlaid because with OMG Commerce, all of our accounts are within the same, essentially, DSP seat. So if we were to give a client access, they would be able to see all the information from all of our clients. So it's just a little bit of extra little tip there to to find out kind of, hey, is this really their own seat or are they, you know, kind of outsourcing this somewhere else? So let, let's go back to strategy, Austin. So you were, you're kind of beginning to lay that out. So third, remarketing and repurchase. Third, kind of mid funnel. And you were talking about being able to target people that are shopping for competitive products. Talked about being able to put an ad on a competitor's product detail page. So so continue the thought there. What? Why is that? So I think that should be obvious. Like why that's so cool, but what? But why is that special? Well, one is you're hopefully drawing sales away from competitors. Which if competitors are selling more or less, and you're selling more, it's going to help your organic rate, and you're going to show up for sponsored ads more. Um. So that's that's kind of the main thing. Whenever we go after anything that's not bottom of funnel, it's stealing a sell away from someone else. Yeah, and how awesome would that be? Like if you, if, if someone gave you this scenario, call it, you know, five, 10 years ago where they said, hey, what if shoppers about to buy your competitor's product and at the last minute you show up and show them your product and show them the price and the reviews and maybe a little message about why it's so awesome. Would you want to do that? Or it would be like, yeah, I want to do that. I'd do that all day long. Um, and I, I remember like back in the early days, and you know, I've been doing this a long time, in the early days of remarketing, back when that was kind of a novel idea, people would ask, hey, can we remarket to our competitors, shoppers? So remarketing, you know, on Google or Facebook or whatever, you're remarketing your own shoppers or your own site visitors. But people have always wondered, can I remarket to my competitors, shoppers? And the answer pre-DSP is, well, no, like or unless your competitor lets you p- pixel their site. Uh, other than that, you can't. But with Amazon DSP, Amazon's like, I don't care. So yeah, sure, use target shoppers of your competitor. Put the ad on the competitor's page. We just want people to purchase. And so if you leverage that and do that right, it's such a powerful way to grow. And the thing you got to keep in mind is like, I think there are some cases where like if I'm looking at Nike shoes on Amazon and a, a pair of Adidas sneaks in there, I'm probably still going to buy the Nike. But for a lot of product categories, we're not super brand loyal. Right, so I'm looking at one product, but I see another brand that's maybe comparable and has better reviews, and I just I like the look of it better. You know, I'm I'm, it's possible that I'll buy that instead. So okay, so that's competitor targeting. Yeah, do you have a, do you have another thought there? Yeah, something I was going to add is with those audiences, if you have one or two top competitors that seem to be performing well, we can make an audience of just those competitor viewers or target just those product pages. If you don't care, we can make an audience of 150 different nations in your category and exclude ones that have a price point that's too high or too low. Um, so the the way that we can customize those audiences to target exactly who we want to target is is 
pretty endless. Uh, one, one of the things I like to think about with the Amazon, and I think this this applies to Google Shopping and, and some of the other marketplaces and stuff, is part of the success here is part advertising, part merchandising, right? Because we, we we're, we're showing up on the digital shelf, and whether that's organic and that's kind of you know Amazon brand management and SEO type of stuff, or if it's sponsored ads, that's you know the the PPC magic that we like to run. But with Amazon DSP, there's a little bit of merchandising too, because it's like we're able to follow someone as they slide down that aisle, right? They're on the on the aisle looking at, at toothpaste or they're looking at, you know, fitness equipment. And as they slide down the aisle away from our products, looking at a competitor's products, we can pop up and say, Hey, hey, what what about what about me? Did you did you think about this? And uh just pretty powerful. And so lots of opportunities there. So that's kinda that's I would say that's kind of mid funnel, right? Maybe it's inching in the top funnel, depending on how you define it. But then what would be kind of some top of funnel strategies? Top of funnel is typically going to be in market audiences, which is people in the market for XYZ category. So let's say you'd sell toothpaste. Um, it, someone might be in the market for oral care products. So maybe they were on Amazon and they went to a product that was in the oral care subcategory. Um, so those are typically the largest audiences, super broad. They do have some some more specific ones here and there, but usually you're gonna get, you know, several million people in an audience like that, sometimes 50 million. Um, so super broad audiences, both in terms of size and in terms of how, how broad the category can be. Um, there are also lifestyle and demographic audiences that can be layered in. So based on people's uh, purchase habits and shopping habits over over their lifetime of being an Amazon shopper. They are obviously really into fitness. They buy a lot of supplements and workout equipment and and athletic apparel. Um, and then another, not necessarily past top of funnel, but the very top of the funnel is is typically where we use video ads. Um, STV, so streaming TV, is kind of the the new big thing there. Um, it's one of those things it's like running TV commercials. It takes a pretty, pretty big investment, but this is about as far up the funnel as you can go. It'd, it'd be comparable to, to YouTube top of funnel advertising. Yeah. And, and we love what, what's possible there with streaming TV. You can show up on Amazon fire TV sticks and Amazon devices and things like that, which there are millions and millions of. Let's talk about those in market audiences really quickly. So Let's uh, g- give me give me a category, also make up a category. Not toothpaste, I think that's a little too broad, but something else. Dog food. Okay, so let's look at dog food. So basically, if we're looking at an in-market audience, let's go a little more specific. Let's go or- organic dog food. Um, so organic dog food. What what does that what does that in-market audience look, and how does someone get in that audience, and how does someone get kicked out or, or, you know, leave that audience. Just just so people can kind of understand who are we targeting if we say, I want an in-market audience for organic dog food. In-market for organic dog food virtually means that within, and it, it's either 28 or 30 days, I believe it's past 28 days of shopping on Amazon side, um, that within the past 28 days, that person has searched, viewed, been in the subcategory for organic dog food. Um, so whether they clicked on a couple products in search results that were um, or labeled organic dog food, maybe that was part of the the title of the the product. Um, some something along their their shopping journey within the last 20 to 28 days indicates that they are about to purchase or wanting to purchase organic dog food. So we know they've been on the aisle, right? So to think about this like a physical store, someone's been on the organic someone's been on the dog food aisle but then they've been down where the organic dog food is right they've been living looking for it they've been shopping and maybe they add it to their their cart and they put it back on the shelf we know there's interest there um and so now we can target them so so what are what are some of the creative ways that that sellers and that we're using you know in market audiences and typically what i like to do um amazon has some pretty good overlap reports that show us how certain in-market audiences overlap with our custom audiences. So let's say we we sell uh, organic dog food and I have an audience that's made up of people that have viewed our product. Um, Amazon is going to show us the in-market and lifestyle audiences that overlap 
Um, so we can we can pick and choose which audiences make the most sense based on how our audience actually fits into those other categories. Once we let something run for a while, we like to pull some audience insights reports that show us what other audiences that we're not targeting interact well with these ads. So maybe people are in the market for organic dog food, but it's also people that live in high income zip codes or people that are over 55. Uh, maybe it's primarily women that click and not men. Um, over time, we can layer in those audiences to get as specific as possible to get the best possible results. What's really cool here, Austin, is you can actually, you can utilize DSP to get more insights into your shoppers, right? To get more insights into your buyers, those people that are looking at your product by saying, hey, what are the what are the related audiences? What's overlapping with my buyer? And yeah, you get to learn some pretty cool things and then that can adjust your targeting. Um, in, anything, and in, in Chris, want to kind of get you involved in this as well. Do, do, you, do you hear any misconceptions when you're talking to potential DSP advertisers or are there, are there areas where they're just kind of like blown away when they hear what's possible on DSP? What's kind of the perspective from an audience standpoint of the people you talk to? Well, first I must say that um, I've got an audience of organic dog food lovers behind me that um, may <laughs> may potentially chime in because um, there's there's uh, someone in the house they don't recognize right now. So, but it, <laughs> you mean you uh, mean the the furry the furry lovers of organic? Oh, dog they were food just e lovers of any dog food in general. It just actually, I think you got so excited about Austin's organic dog food example that it just could not contain himself but makes sense <laughs> yeah so at, at any rate uh you your question was around uh what was that because now i'm off into dog food yeah right? and it's, it's totally okay that the dogs are which by the way i'm going to say something kind of controversial not super related but just curious to me uh, curious what kind of dog feed dog food you feed your dogs chris because I, i've seen i've started to see this trend of like vegan dog food and that's always surprised me because I've always thought dogs were meat eaters. Um, or what? What are your dogs meat eaters, Chris? Or are you feeding them, you know, veggies and stuff? Actually, they are loving this week because I cooked some fantastic ribeyes out on the grill the other night. And Dude, you're giving your dogs ribeyes. Giving dogs ribeyes. We are also. I'm going to tell you what kind of a of a of a couple Jenny and I are. We offered to babysit my daughter's boyfriend's poodle while they are in Central America for two months. And um, anyway, it's one thing walking a dog like our Pomapoo, who's about this big, and it's another walking a dog of that size. And let's just say that the plastic bag has to be larger. That's all I'm going to say. And we, I think this relates to your question. It's because we, we feed them, like we left those ribeyes, had to put them up way up on the refrigerator so the dog wouldn't get them. And then we woke up the next morning, realized we never put them in the refrigerator. So they've been getting cut ribeye chunks for the last several days <laughs> and, uh, and they're loving it. But we actually do buy the fresh food in the refrigerated section at Walmart, which is like the organic stuff that doesn't have all the fillers. And we mix that in with some really high quality food. But you asked, there's the answer. Fascinating. Totally a side note, but super interesting. Hey, I believe there's a market for anything. So sell, sell vegan dog food. Oh, sounds it increases awesome. engagement I... in your podcast. People love dog stories. <laughs> yeah, for like, sure. This is going to sure. be so... the only part people maybe think. <laughs> Like, I love that podcast, especially the dog food well, segment. I like the dog part. And how, why does Chris give his dogs ribeyes? It's crazy. <laughs> but when you leave it out, no refrigerator makes sense. So, Chris, what I was talking about, though, was, was audiences. So yeah. what are the – because you, you talk to people when they first reach out to OMG yeah. and they're like, hey, what's possible with DSP? What are, the, what are either the misconceptions about audience targeting or the things people get really excited about related to audience targeting? Oh, gosh. They just don't know. They're, they just they don't know. They've heard DSP. They've heard it can be great. They don't know. They aren't familiar with the different audience types. Again, that's a good vetting out for your agency is how well does your agency understand all the audience types, all the various targeting, and where you should actually start. We don't do this with everyone, but like, you know, and I think we also are, are sensitive to people's uh, interest in getting a good return. You know, sometimes people just want to see, hey, what is my return actually going to be? And in those cases, we'll actually recommend, hey, let's start more bottom of funnel. Let's get you those retargeting audiences. And most people that they get that audience right away, retargeting. 
there is some confusion sometimes about where their ads are actually going to appear to these audiences on platform, off platform. But, um, you know, we've got a great resource uh, in our strategy document that we can share with with folks. And I'd be happy anybody wants to contact the podcast to send this over to them. That kind of lists those those different audiences out. I think we still have a resource on our website, the DSP roadmap that goes through some of those audiences. That's a like I would highly recommend if you are a newbie to DSP and you want to know more, like that's a great resource to grab and, and it's a very easy read. So uh, a couple things to talk about. You know, we, we, we talked about some of the kind of the traditional things to do. Like, hey, if you're selling organic dog food, let's target that. If you're selling, you know, tooth whitening, toothpaste for sensitive teeth, even though I said don't talk about toothpaste, uh, you know, that you target people that are in that in the market for that. But you can also get creative in addition to that. So use this as an example, silicone wedding rings. I've seen ads for silicone wedding rings looking at treadmills or looking at other exercise and fitness equipment. So, um, you know, ways to look at, hey, what else might someone be shopping for that's very related or complementary to my product? Or they would indicate, hey, someone's looking for that. They would benefit from that product as well. Um, just bought the health tracker. Are you doubling up there too? This is a health, so yeah, so we're gonna talk about this is like a sleep tracker, health tracker, it's an aura ring. But same thing, like if you start to see, hey, this this looks like this is a biohacker. This is someone who's buying all kinds of fitness stuff and supplements and crazy things like that. Let's show them an ad for an aura ring, right? And so so you can begin to do things like that too to find someone who's likely to be a customer of yours. And and that's one of the other things about the the audience overlap report that we can pull. Sometimes audiences show up there, show up in that report that it's like but why is someone that's in the market for this clicking on my product at a high rate? Um, it, it shows you things that you wouldn't have ever thought of. Right. Just just shows you hey, other ways to merchandise and sell this product. And this is a perfect opportunity to do what I've been able to do on every podcast I've ever been on with you is that I actually was in the market for one of those uh, order rings, one of those little biohacking devices. But I, I got it down to, the, to two, but I just could not make a decision. I was just... I was just frozen because it was just, you know, an either or a yeah, yeah, decision. Yeah. So I, I knew I knew it was coming, uh, listeners. I, I should have stepped in. I should have spared you. I should have put 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 the kibosh on it. I, when Chris warms up like that, I'm like, okay, there's a pun. There's a pun. Uh, there's a pun impending here. But no, that's actually pretty good. Either or, uh, I get it. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's talk about measuring DSP because this is. This is one of the more interesting parts about DSP. I mentioned that that sometimes there are people on platforms that talk ill towards DSP. I saw a Twitter storm, a good buddy of mine who's in the space, texted me late one night. He's like, dude, do you see what's happening on Twitter right now about Amazon DSP? So I looked and I chimed in and I talked to my, my buddy and stuff. But, you know, a lot of misconceptions about how DSP is measured. So what do we need to know about DSP measurement, Austin? Yeah, which one thing that I, I tell every client that we bring on is I take, especially ROAS numbers, I take um, those attribution numbers with a grain of salt because it is view-based attribution. Um, one question that we get asked a lot is, okay, I'm selling this product. Someone looked at this product and then we showed a DSP ad and then they purchased. Where are they going to come back and buy anyways? There's no way to quantify that. Um, I guarantee that some of the people would have come back and bought anyways, um, which is why we, we take the numbers with a grain of salt. Um, there's no exact formula for accounting for that, but we do know that there there has to be some over attribution um, just because all the numbers point that that there is. So we like to, we, we expect ROAS numbers that are above realistic um, if they're lower than what we expect, then then something's probably not going quite quite right. But yeah, I think that's to be you know there's some amount of that with anything you do. You know, it, it Facebook is going to attribute more. They're going to lean more into f- Facebook uh, attribute. You know, the things that led to conversions there. It's going to lean heavier there. And so I think I think that's common. I I do think that Amazon because of the nature of what it is. Uh, I think you just, you have to go into it with, again, that longer view, because if you fall in love with your early returns of what you see in the reporting just from a retargeting basis, 
those are going to change as you move more up a funnel and you've got to see over time how it impacts the the bigger picture yeah and, and i kind of nerd out about attribution i like it so i'm gonna i'm gonna give my point of view on this and try not to get too nerdy um i hear people say things like Amazon attribution is wrong, right? And my take on any attribution is it's only wrong if it's broken. If it's not working the way it was intended to work, that's when it's truly wrong. Otherwise, wrong is probably not the right word to use. You just need to understand what is this measuring? Because when you look at like Facebook attribution, it's, it's measuring what it says it's going to measure. If you look at Google Analytics, it's measuring according to a set of standards. One example here, and this may not be a great example for everybody. I'm not an accountant. I've never aspired to be an accountant, but you got cash accounting. You got accrual accounting. You would never say that cash accounting is wrong and accrual accounting is right. Maybe accrual accounting is preferred for your business model. It's just two different ways of measuring. And so what you got to look at with, with Amazon DSP is that it's not a click-based conversion only. It's also impression-based. And that actually makes sense here. Now, you may be like, oh, well, I, I, I can't. I can't handle impression-based conversions. Well, but you're also buying it based on impressions. So that's why Amazon is doing it. But so that's not right. That's not good, bad, right, wrong. It just is what it is. So if you know that conversions are coming in view-based or click-based, that's going to help shed light on what you're looking at. And that kind of plays into what you said, Austin, where, yeah, we probably want to overshoot a little bit on ROAS uh, because there may be some view-based conversions that are attributed that maybe those people are going to buy anyway if they didn't see the ad. So maybe we need to be a little more conservative in, in our, our look at things. Were we going to add something to that, Austin? Yeah. You were talking about attribution models is you have to understand that Amazon uses last touch with an emphasis on clicks. Right. Right. That's another great point. Yeah. And I think it's across all ad types. Now, I know at one point, I think sponsored brand used to a different look back, but I believe across all ad types, it's a 14-day attribution window. Um, yep. So if someone clicks any type of sponsored ad, sponsored product, brand display, and then views a DSP ad, as long as they don't click that DSP ad and they still purchase within the 14 days of the original click, the click gets the attribution. So DSP is not going to get a sale attributed when a PPC click took place within the same attribution window. Yeah. And I love that. And again, not to get too technical because that can just be too much for a podcast, but there is a little bit of setup as a token you have to place, right? To get, to get everything communicated, to get DSP communicated with your sponsored product ads and stuff and sponsored display and sponsored brand. Uh, but yeah, once everything is communicating, then only one ad is going to get the credit. And so that's a really good call out. If, if I clicked on an ad and then I see a DSP ad, DSP is not going to get credit and I convert. Or if I click on a DSP ad or just view a DSP ad first, and that's what gets me interested. And then I search for you and click on a sponsored product ad, that sponsored product ad is going to get the uh, the credit for the conversion. So you got to understand what it's measuring to know how it's working. One thing that we haven't talked about yet, which as an agency, we're just getting our feet wet in is AMC, which one of the nice things about AMC, which is Amazon Marketing Cloud, um, is they have queries that give us different attribution models. So if we want to see based on first touch or last touch or multi-touch, we can see the path to conversion and maybe eight times out of 10, that in-market audience was the first touch attribution, but it's getting almost no credit because they're converting through a DSP retargeting or a sponsored brand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so good. And, and, you know, there, there's some areas where Amazon is way ahead of Google, right? As an example, competitor targeting and stuff like that. Can't do that on Google for obvious reasons, but then there are other areas where like this, like comparing attribution models, like that's kind of table stakes in, in Google, but it's, it's not available everywhere in Amazon, but it is inside of the Amazon marketing cloud. And that's, what's so interesting, you know, to use a football analogy, what, what if someone didn't really understand the game of football, right? And we're we're all Chiefs fans. Go Chiefs, go, go Mahomes. What if someone didn't understand football, but they did understand that the person in the end zone with the ball, they're the one that scores. They're the one that gets points. Someone could look at Mahomes and look at the Chiefs and say, it's the receivers, right? It's the, it's the wide receivers and the running back. They're the ones that have, they have the ball in the end zone, not that dude, you know, with, uh, uh, kind of the, the crazy voice or whatever, number 15, it's not him. 
it's uh, it's the guy in the end zone. But we all know, like it's it's the quarterback that sets it up. And in some ways, that that's what DSP does. It's the setup. It's the setup for the actual conversion. But you can only see that if you run DSP long enough, and you're measuring lift, and you're measuring total sales, and you're looking at your tacos, uh, or if you're looking at like an AMC report and seeing, hey, you know what? Like DSP was the first click or the first impression on 20% of my conversions or 30% of my conversions or whatever. So um, yeah, understanding the role that DSP, DSP plays, understanding how Amazon measures it, all that's really important to to crafting the right strategy and knowing when to press the gas pedal and when to hit the great brake pedal uh, as you're building your business. Yeah. So what you're saying, Brett, is this is a great, this is a great podcast or, or post is you this is how you don't fumble in the yeah, attribution game. You do not want game. to fumble. You 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 don't want to get right red zone. That was a great example. I, I really I do think you gotta you gotta you gotta go with that somewhere. That and I will say that's one reason why I like the NFL more than Amazon because NFL uses multi touch attribution. Quarterback gets credit, lineman get credit, receiver gets credit. Amazon's all last touch. So true. Yeah, yeah. Even the guys, even the NFL gets multi touch attribution. Basketball, multi-touch attribution. You got assists, you got rebounds, you got points, all that. Anyway, uh, so get get with the program. No, no, just last click. What are some other considerations here? If I'm if I'm just getting if I'm listening to this and I'm like, okay, I'm a successful Amazon seller. When do I know the time is right for me to start on DSP? And then what should I start with? You kind of alluded to this before. There's a point when you you're running PPC ads that. You're, you're spending about as much as the platform will let you, you're efficient, you're making money, but you've plateaued. You, you can't really push any further. Any incremental dollar you spend is just like, it's just going to Amazon, you're not getting much out of that. And that's kind of the point where DSP comes into play. Um, if your PPC is, you're holding it back because performance is not that good, DSP is not gonna come in and magically make everything more efficient. DSP is there whenever you've plateaued and you're ready to grow. Um, I would never, never recommend it for a brand who's, there the dog's waiting for that organic dog food. Uh, <laughs> I'd never recommend it for a brand who is not in a great spot on the PPC side of things. Um, or if they're in a, a super big growth stage and we don't know where PPC is going to go, because then we don't really know where to start with DSP whenever PPC has so much fluctuation. So I like to look at DSP as the percentage of overall ad spend. Let's say you're spending $200,000 a month on PPC. Um, at, at the right spot, I'd like to be spending roughly $50,000, $75,000 on the DSP side. Keep like a, a one to three, one to four ratio. Um, so if, you're, if you've hit that point, and it, you don't have to be spending $200,000, that's just an example. But if you, if you hit that point where your PVC ads are going well, they're efficient, but you've plateaued and you want to continue growing. That's where DSP comes into play. Um, we like to start small with bottom of the funnel campaigns just to make sure return is going to be what we hope and expect it to be. But we also come in with a, a playbook that has a, a built-in ramp up period. So month one, we might only run minimal spend on retargeting, repurchasing, but there's already a plan in place for month two and month three to add mid and upper funnel and to scale budgets. Um, so there's no there's no guesswork whenever month three hits like, oh, what campaigns do we want to start now? We already, we already know what campaigns we're going with, um, assuming everything to that point is performing like we think it should. Yeah, I love that. You know, really this uh, uh, DSP is a way to accelerate growth. It's not the way to fix fundamental business problems. It's it's not the way to grow your business when there are other more pressing issues. It it's what works when you've got a stable foundation, good product, good reviews, good sponsored product, sponsored display, sponsored brand video, things that are not sponsored display, sponsored brand, sponsored brand video. Then you go hard on on DSP. Yeah, uh, Chris, what what? How do you advise people? Because people come to you. You you're the you're the first one that people talk to typically. What are you advising people on when they should, when they know they're ready for DSP? Yeah, and, and I would just say these are not hard and fast, you know, rules or anything. This is just strictly me having a lot of discussions with Austin and the team and, and evaluating brands. 
because I, I could say, you know, easily, oh, you need to have at least a $25,000 a month PPC budget so that we could at least have a, an incremental spend to start with on on DSP. This is a, if you're not coming in and saying, hey, we want to run top of funnel and we've got this budget set aside and we're good for that. But I, I think you do having a healthy PPC spend is a good in indicator that you could uh, be successful on DSP. I'll let Austin speak to to more about that. And we're also going to be ones that are going to say, hey, you know, we don't think we're going to analyze that because you've got to have enough sessions and visits to your product page. That's a key thing that we we can't, even if you wanted to, we couldn't even get advertising. There's certain products Amazon won't let us advertise on DSP for certain categories. But also, you know, if your sessions are running, let's just say roughly below 7,500 a month in a 30 day look back window, it's probably not going to go anywhere. But I, I'd, I'd want to lean on Austin for any additional uh, things you might say on that topic. Yeah. And I'd say even 7,500 at this point is pretty conservative, even if that audience does go. 7,500, what, Austin? Could you, could you clarify that? Sessions. What? So if sessions or with vendor accounts, it's called a glance view. So that's basically how many individuals, individual sessions of people visiting the page have occurred over whatever look back window. Um, we, we do 30 day audiences. So we always look at a 30 day look back window. Awesome. Well, guys, we, um, have even exceeded the allotted time that I thought we would spend, but it's been so good. I still love DSP. Like as, as a marketing junkie, as a long time advertising marketing guy, DSP just fires me up, man. It's just unique. It's got unique targeting capabilities. It's got all kinds of data at your disposal. Some really, really cool stuff you can use with DSP. It is advanced. It's not the first thing you should do, but it is something that should be a part of your growth strategy if you're a serious Amazon seller, serious about growing a brand on Amazon. And so, hey, if you're interested, omgcommerce.com, click on the Let's Talk button and uh, let's talk about DSP. You'll almost certainly talk to be talking to Chris at some point, and then if everything looks good, you'll probably talk to Austin as well. But, uh, gentlemen, any closing thoughts on it, on DSP or anything marketing related, or hey, even say Chiefs related? My my closing thoughts would be, you know, anytime you have uncertainty in an economic environment, we see people pull back on spend, pull pull back on certain areas. I have seen. I don't, I don't know if I've seen as low of like an inbound interest in DSP since we've been doing this for six years. To me, it lines up exactly with the economic conditions that are out there. And yet, OMG has consistent advertisers that are still running DSP. And I, I would just highly recommend that's got to go into your thought process. When people pull back, it's a great opportunity to put yourself right back in. And a little bit more to add in, in closing thoughts on like when to consider DSP. If you think of it like account health, seller account health as as personal health. Um, if you go talk to a personal trainer and your uh, your diet is trash, they're going to tell you to get your diet right before you start working out. And I like to see view PPC and DSP as diet versus exercise. We could we could work out all day long on DSP, but if you're not eating right then it's pointless. Whereas if you if you get your diet right, you start eating well, get healthy, then you can work out and actually see gains. Yeah, and even to go next level and to, to talk about my ring for just a minute, if if your diet and exercise are, are right, but your sleep is garbage, you're going to be sunk too. So you got good sponsor products, you got good DSP, but there's like fundamental business issues. We can't, we can't fix those either. But lo love that analogy, love Amazon DSP. So check it out, omgcommerce.com. With that, gentlemen, thank you. This was entertaining. This was fun. We covered a lot of subjects. Chiefs, dogs, organic versus vegan versus meat, you know, for dogs, uh, plus a lot of marketing goodness. So thanks, fellas. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. And as always, thank you for tuning in. We'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on the socials. I'm actually pretty active on LinkedIn right now, so hit me up. Uh, or check us out on Instagram and YouTube. The YouTube channel is growing, so check that out as well. And with that, until next time, thank you for listening.